I have it on good authority that we have two birthdays today also. It doesn't happen very often where we have two birthdays falling on the same day. Uh, Eugenio Frank's uh, 39th birthday is today. Um, uh, just kidding. Yeah, well, it is his birthday today, but I'm not sure that it's his 39th. And then, of course, Grace Buxton's birthday is today also. She is 49. Um, and uh, since it's both of your birthdays, let's sing together. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear me. <laughs>
enthusiasm, gladness. Now, let's drill down just a little bit and ask ourselves the question, why? Why the joy? For what reason are these fellas filled with joy, delight, pleasure, gladness? Because let's make no mistake, it is certainly not because all is well. It's not because things are great. It's not because they're on top of things, praise the Lord. In fact, the powers that murdered Jesus 40 days earlier have not disappeared. In fact, at this time, every follower of Christ is still under threat and could well be hunted down at any moment. The text here is referring to the joy of 11 disciples, 12 disciples minus 1, Judas. But the text in Acts chapter 2, at the end of Acts chapter 2, is referring to at least 120 disciples. And then at the end of Acts 2, it says God added 3,000 more to that number. So now there is at least 3,120 believers, and all of them are filled with joy. And a crowd that size, undoubtedly some of them are ill, yet they're filled with joy. Undoubtedly, some of them have family members who have cancer or tuberculosis or cardiovascular problems. Yet they're filled with joy. Some of them, undoubtedly, are out of work. Some of them are failing parents. Some of them are poor. Some of them are lonely. Some of them have lived unsavory lives. Some of them have wayward kids. Some of them have failing or broken marriages, yet here they all are. All 3,120 of them are filled with joy, gladness, delight, pleasure. This joy has nothing to do with favorable circumstances. In fact, Jesus said in John 16, in this life, you will have trouble, yet you will also have joy. So how can you have joy when trouble is an inevitability. How can you have joy when life is difficult? So let's ask that question. Why did they have joy? They returned to Jerusalem with great joy. How so? How can that be? The answer lies in the text right above that verse that I've just read. You. The text right above this contains Jesus' last words to these 11 men. There are four promises in this text that explain the joy. The last thing Jesus tells these 11 men is four promises that you can take to the Bible. Four promises that are absolutely guaranteed to anybody who will take God seriously. These are the same four promises that are made to every single believer and they are the reason for the joy of every believer all over the world in any age regardless of circumstances. These are the four promises that you get when you get Jesus. These are the only four promises that you get when you get Jesus. Some people have the notion that God promises you all sorts of different blessings and favor and will evaporate all of your troubles and problems if you trust Jesus. But he doesn't. God promises you only four things that are guaranteed to any believer, in any circumstance, in any age, in any place in the world. These four promises are true for a believer who is living in the GTA like you and I are. And these four promises are true for a follower of Jesus Christ living in southern Iraq, southern Syria or northern Iraq under the threat of ISIS. 
So what are they? Well, let's take down and see them. Here's the four promises. Number one, these guys got the promise of illumination. That's the first thing that caused their joy. Look what it says in verse 45. Then he opened their minds, that's Jesus. Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. This was critical. This is the foundational reason for their joy. He opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Their minds got illuminated. That's what produced the joy. They now not only knew scripture, they understood scripture. Lots of people know scripture, but they don't understand scripture, and therefore it doesn't affect their life. I mean, you could be looking at the most important medical breakthrough in history on a written page. But if you don't understand a word of what you're reading, it's hard for you to get excited that this is the greatest medical breakthrough in history. You only, you only get excited about the text when you understand the text. And Jesus is enabling them and illuminating their minds to understand the scripture for the first time in their life. And it is that that is producing the joy. The scriptures produce joy. Psalm 119 said that would happen. Psalm 119, the writer says, I rejoice over your word. I stand in awe of your word. I love your word. I praise you for your word. Because I understand your word. Read through the Gospels before Jesus opened their minds to understand the scripture. And what do you find the disciples doing over and over and over and over again? You find the disciples repeatedly not understanding. They were thick, spiritually speaking. But when they understood the scriptures, that changed everything. I remember one Wednesday night, Mary Fabach uh, telling us we were teaching through a one of the psalms, and uh, as I got to the end of that particular psalm, I remember Mary, it was maybe a year or so after George had died, and Mary testified how that psalm had been her source of strength and stability in the days and weeks and months after George had died. I know people who could read that psalm and it doesn't make any impact on them at all because they don't understand it. But Mary read that psalm and she understood it. And it produced joy in her heart. <coughs> Understanding the scripture is what produces joy. I, a few years ago, a friend of mine went in for surgery early one morning and it, it, nobody took him down and his family members were all working and busy and he had to take the bus down for his surgery and he told me afterwards that he went into the lobby of the hospital and he was feeling really down, feeling really lonely and he went into the chapel and there was a Bible open on the little pulpit and he went over and he read the psalm that was open and that psalm, it, it talked about even though my friends and my family forsake me, you are with me. And that psalm produced such a strength and a stability and a joy in his heart. And he heard God speak to him, I'm here, I'm with you, it's going to be okay. Because he understood the scriptures and the scriptures produced joy. I remember after 9-11, the Sunday after 9-11, someone here signed the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I've heard that prayer sung a hundred times. Of course, I've read it thousands of times. But I understood one line in that prayer that day in a way that I'd never understood it before. Deliver us from evil. Man, I got a new understanding of that 
word that day that produced a joy in my heart that God is on the throne and He's still in control because I understood the Scripture. That's why Psalm 119 verse 18 prays that magnificent little prayer. Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things out of your law. That's our prayer. That's what we need. To have our eyes open, to have our mind illuminated, to have an understanding of what this word means. No matter what's going on in your life, I promise you, when the scriptures are illuminated for you, when the Holy Spirit gives you an understanding into this word, it will produce a spirit of joy unlike anything else in your life ever can. That's the first thing. He got, they got the promise of illumination. Here's the second one. They got the promise of eternal life. They understood for the very first time in their lives that death wasn't final. Look at verse 46. Then he said to them, Thus it is written in the Old Testament prophecies he's talking about, that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. Jesus promised them that the Old Testament scriptures prophesied that I was going to die and I was going to come back from the dead. This is not all accidental. This did not catch the Father by surprise. All of this was recorded hundreds of years ago because prophecy is simply writing down history before it happens. And when Jesus died, they thought that was it. I mean, that's what we would think because that's how we understand death. When Jesus died, they thought it was all over. They thought the dream had died. Every disciple, every follower scattered that day at the cross. And they thought that they were going to be next. Because you see, death is final. Death is the great intimidator. Everybody bows the knee to death. Everybody's scared of death. Death is the great joy robber. Nobody wants to think about death. Mind you, that tended not to be true back in Ireland growing up 40 odd years ago. Back in Ireland, they faced death head on. <laughs> I can remember when my grandfather died, they had him in the coffin, laid out, that's how they would say it, laid out in the coffin in the front room in my grandfather's house for days before the funeral. And I was 10 years old, and I can remember getting dragged in and lifted up and my face put right into my grandfather's face so that I could face death head on. Because that's the way they deal with death in Ireland. Maybe it's not the same these days. We've become more civilized, I suppose, these days. But I, could, I remember as a kid, I could not believe how family members were able to sleep upstairs with a dead body downstairs. But we don't do that here. We're more civilized. We, we tuck the body away out of sight. We're uncomfortable with death. But one day Jesus stopped a funeral procession. And he told the mother who was burying her boy to stop crying. And then he spoke to the dead body. I mean, you don't do that at a funeral. You don't walk into the middle of a funeral procession and stop it. You don't walk up to the mother who's burying her young boy and telling her to stop crying. And you don't speak to the dead body in the middle of the funeral procession. But Jesus did. And the amazing thing is that the boy came back to life. He set up, he set up in the casket and Jesus said, what are you all looking at? Get the kids something to eat. <laughs> Jesus put the fun back in the funeral. Jesus told a dead guy by the name of Lazarus, come here, come out of the grave. And he came out, and Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life, and whoever believes in me, though he die physically, will never, 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 never die eternally. Our text here, he pointed to the scriptures. He said, 
to the disciples. You don't ever need to be scared of death ever again. I have conquered death. And let's all agree on this. Whoever controls death controls life. And whoever controls life controls everything. Jesus said in John 5, 21, the Son gives life to whoever He wants. After the resurrection, they understood that death was not the end. Death has now been declawed. Death is now just a doorway from here to eternity. <coughs> Heaven is in our future. Because whoever controls death controls life, and whoever controls life controls everything. That is what produced the joy. Death no longer has a hold, a grip on these men's hearts. That's why they're full of joy. Because they now understand the scripture and they now understand that death is not final. There's a third promise. And that is the promise of forgiveness. They understood for the first time that failure was forgivable. Look at verse 47. Repentance and forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in His name. These guys needed to hear that. These guys needed to hear that failure is not fatal. They had blundered badly. For three years they had walked with our Lord. They were full of bravado during that three years. They had argued among themselves about which of them was the greatest. Peter had said, Lord, even if all these guys abandon you, you can count on me. I'm your man. I'll never leave you. These guys were full of pride for three years. They told children to buzz off because they thought they were more important than kids. Yet here, when the rubber hit the road, when the chips are down, when the real test came, Jesus is on the cross, they all ran like rats off a sinking ship. They were all colossal failures, every last one of them. And in Luke chapter 24, they are plagued by guilt and shame. That's a common problem. Shame. First time it ever showed up was in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve rebelled against God. The record says that Adam hid. There is the hint of shame. And then it says they covered themselves with terribly inadequate coverings, fig leaves. And because of their shame, because they understood they were naked and the human condition has been doing that ever since, trying to cover shame with inadequate camouflage. And that's where addictive behaviors come from. An inadequate attempt to hide shame. And then shame leads to blame. Adam blamed God and his wife for his failure. And then Eve blamed the snake and the snake didn't have a leg to stand on. Uh, bless your heart, you've heard that so many times and you still chuckle. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of people like that today. Shame is different than guilt. Guilt is a response to something that I do that I believe is wrong. Shame is a belief that there's something wrong with me. Guilt says, I feel... Shame says, I am a failure. And so finally at the cross where Jesus died, failure and mistakes and wrong choices and regrets and blunders are all finally forgiven. The case goes to court and the person is found guilty, they are able to appeal to the next higher court. I have people tell me, Roy, yeah, yeah, I get that. I get that the Bible 
Bible says God forgives me. My problem is I have trouble forgiving myself. And so I point out that in our court system, that if you don't like the decision of a particular court, you can appeal to a higher court. And you can go all the way up to the Supreme Court of Canada, where nine justices decide the fate of the one on the docket. But once they render their decision, once the Supreme Court renders its decision, there is no higher court in the land by which you can appeal. The Supreme Court has the last word, the final verdict. And so I point out to my friends who say, well, I know God forgives me, but I can't forgive myself. I point out that God is the Supreme Court in all the universe. God is the judge of all the earth, the Bible says. He is the Supreme Court of the universe. There is no higher authority. And when God brings down the gavel and declares you forgiven, that's the last word. There is no higher court. Nobody can appeal to a higher court. And so when people think that they, that though God forgives me, I cannot forgive myself, they think that they are a higher court than God. They're setting themselves up as a higher court than the court of the sovereign God of the universe. I remember going to court uh, some years ago with a young man at, at my other church. He, he was 16 years old and this young man had bought himself a little car, as 16-year-olds are prone to do, and, and he was fixing up this old car in his garage, his father's garage. And, and I guess he got tired of waiting, and one afternoon, temptation got the better of him, and he slapped a couple of old plates from the garage on the car and foolishly took the car out for a spin. And so he's driving down the road, and a police car is coming toward him, and the young man panicked, and <laughs> I guess the one thing you ought not to do if you're in that situation is to look at the cop and just keep your eyes straight ahead and drive on. But this young man panicked, and he looked at the cop, and he continued to look at the cop as the cop was driving by. And of course, the cop was continuing to look at him, and the squad car turned around, pulled him over, and charged him with having no driver's license, no sticker, no insurance, no seatbelt. And most serious of all, driving with stolen plates. So he ended up with a court date to see the judge. 16 years old. Waiting for that court date was the longest six months of that young man's life. He came to church every Sunday. I knew him, I knew him very well. He was part of our church family. I knew his mom and dad very, very well. Came to church every Sunday with a weight the size of an anvil on his head. I could almost see the weight of guilt and shame and gloom over his young head, dreading his day of judgment. Well, the day came and his father and I went along with him to court. He walked into that courtroom like a dead man walking. You'd have thought he was going to the gas chamber. The judge was a fair man. He listened to the charges. He Listen to his father give positive testimony about his boy. The judge listened to my testimony about the boy and his character. He was a good boy. He made a stupid mistake. The judge asked the boy, Are you in school? Asked him about his grades. And he was in school. Unfortunately, he was getting good grades. The judge says, have you learned your lesson? Will this ever happen again? The young man said, no, sir, I promise. In fact, I don't even want to get my driver's license. I never want to drive a car ever again in my life. The judge said, stay in school. Get your license. And stay out of trouble. And he brought down the gavel and said, case dismissed. I've never seen a boy looked so relieved, so free in all of my life. He looked, well, <laughs> forgiven. He walked out of that courtroom like he was filled with helium. Released, free, full of joy, unspeakable. That's what happened to us at the cross. We got forgiveness. And that's where the joy comes.
comes from. And no matter what mistakes you've made, no matter who's disappointed in you, no matter who's mad at you, God loves you and has forgiven you and has brought down the gavel if you trust Christ and has said you're free to go. Joy is the reason that their joy is because they realize now that they've been forgiven completely. That's why they're full of joy. They understand the scriptures. They understand that death is no longer uh, got its claws into them. It's not been declawed. And they now understand they've been forgiven. There's one more. They got the promise of the Holy Spirit. They understood the Holy Spirit is available. Look at verse 49. I am sending you the promise of my Father upon you. Now, if you want to check any good uh, commentary, they will say Jesus is referring here to the Holy Spirit. John chapter 14, Jesus says, I'm going to give you a promise. I will not leave you as orphans I will ask the Father, and the Father will give you another helper, another comforter, who will be with you and will be in you. In the Holy Spirit, that's where the joy comes from. You know what you get when you get the Holy Spirit? You get the fruit of the Spirit. You get the nine qualities of the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, you get love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. That's where the joy comes from. Because you now have the Holy Spirit within you. You have the presence of the indwelling Spirit of the living Christ. The Holy Spirit will also give you the abiding presence of Christ. You experience joy because the Spirit of Christ is now inside you. The Apostle Paul said, at my first defense, everybody abandoned me and I was left alone. But Christ stood by my side. Every believer is promised the comforting, abiding strength of the presence of Christ no matter what adversity you're facing. That's why I love your words about him. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. I wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful. And my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior. Love for me. There is a test that you can use when you hear a sermon in order to test whether that sermon is indeed true. The test is this. Does this teaching work in the persecuted church. Push it a bit further. <clears throat> Does this teaching make sense for 147 Christian young people in Kenya who are executed because many of them refuse to deny the name of Christ? Does this sermon work for them? Well, let's see. Is it possible for a young man or a young woman in southern Syria or northern Iraq under the boot of ISIS to experience joy when they face beheading because God has illuminated the scriptures for them and enabled them to understand the supernatural nature 
and strength of this word. Is it possible that a young person who has that illumination can experience joy facing such terror? Is it possible for a young person facing that ultimate horror to understand that death is not final? That this life is like grass that is here today and tomorrow is gone. This word says two things about this life are true. Number one, it's short. And number two, you don't know when it's going to end. Does that get traction with a young person facing the ultimate horror? That there is an eternity in heaven where you will abide with the living Christ forever and ever and ever. Sometimes the day seems long and sorrow's hard to bear. We're tempted to complain and murmur and despair. But Christ will soon appear and catch His bride away. All tears will soon be over in God's eternal day. It will be worth it all. We see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of His dear face, all sorrow will erase. I'll gladly run the race till we see Christ. Does that get traction? What about this one? Facing the ultimate horror at the hands of ISIS. Understanding that the personal presence of the living Christ is right there with them, strengthening them, producing the fruit of the Spirit in their heart, love, joy, and peace, patience, kindness, and goodness, giving them a strength that is beyond themselves. Does that have traction in the face of the ultimate horrific reality? promise. They are forgiven completely. Does that get traction? See, here's what I don't get. If Christ is not real, then why is Christ hated so much? Why would you hate and murder because of something on someone who isn't true? These guaranteed promises are true for the persecuted Christian, and they are true for any Christian, anywhere, anytime, any place. And no matter what your circumstances are today, no matter how dark, Christ wants you to have joy. Because you understand the Scriptures. Because you're not afraid of death. Because you've been found not guilty. And because you have the indwelling Holy Spirit. And you are in the presence of the resurrected and living Christ. And when you are in His presence, you know joy and gladness and delight and pleasure. Isn't it interesting that Robin quoted Psalm 16 in the middle of his prayer. Having no idea what I was going to speak on this morning. And Psalm 16 says, in His presence... His fullness of joy in His right hand are pleasures forevermore. Robert had no idea that verse was in my notes. This is the abiding promise for every believer. These are the only four promises that are guaranteed to every believer in every place at every time, no matter your circumstances.